Hello, I'm Marie-Pierre Saint-Ange from Columbia University. And I'm Christopher Gardner from Stanford. We're from the Lifestyle Council and we just finished chairing a session this morning covering the David Kochevsky lecture as well as a session aligning public consumer uh, food interest and industry with our American Heart Association 2020 goals for dietary uh, impact. So first we heard um, Ramon Estrich who won the uh, the David Kruszewski Lectureship Award this morning. He talked about the Mediterranean diet and the, uh, the PREDIMED study, how important that was in, in really uh, shaping the, the landscape of the Mediterranean diet for cardiovascular disease risk reduction. I was actually surprised to, to hear a bit about how even in the Mediterranean area, individuals are consuming less and less of a traditional Mediterranean diet and on a zero to 14 score with a higher scoring being a higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet, these individuals who are there really have this background of Mediterranean diet are at an eight, eight and a half point. And that increasing their adherence to the Mediterranean diet with consumption of extra virgin olive oil as well as consumption of nuts can really improve their cardiometabolic risk profile when you compare it to a low fat diet which has really been ingrained in in our, in our minds as to something that we should be aiming for. These people who are following the Predimed diet really were consuming upwards of 44, 45% of energy from fats and our recommendations are still going for, towards 30, 35% yeah. of energy from fat. And even at such high fat intakes from monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats, we're getting uh, reductions in cardiometabolic risk factors and cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. And now also they're going towards a better mental health with a Mediterranean diet. So I think that was a very exciting lecture to hear and, and very encouraging in terms of, of dietary recommendations being loosened in terms of uh, the dietary fat intakes and, and having a broader, uh, broader scope for people. And it was nice the way he went through the whole Mediterranean food pyramid showing all the different components. So there was a large focus on the olive oil and the nuts which were distributed to participants but really as they taught the whole Mediterranean diet it was the whole grains and the mm -hmm. legumes and limited amounts of red meat and dairy. Yeah and the other thing too was that not everything needed to be eaten every day. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about our own dietary guidelines we're often focused on what we should be eating in the context of a, a day but they're also focusing on things that should be consumed a few times a week. So it was a fun kickoff from a great study and a great investigator, mm -hmm. added some international flavor. And then we moved into a pilot test of a session where we brought in somebody from the culinary world. So Greg Drescher has been the director of strategic development and industry representation. He's been starting up all these programs with uh, combinations of scientists and the food folks. So he's got Kraft and Compass Food Group, et cetera, with Harvard School of Public Health and some of my colleagues thinking about ways that chefs can drive behavior change with taste, leading with taste. They're the ones who know how to make food taste great. So he had one, one of my favorite lines that he gave is this thing where we're we know about health, we have a great evidence base for health, and then we say, yeah, we should get everybody to eat healthy food. Oh, and it should taste good too. Almost as an afterthought, mm -hmm. which often doesn't work. And so a lot of his presentation was about the deliciousness of food, and that as a culinarian, you can use your resources and your training to bring in health and environmental sustainability and wrap that all into something delicious. So. That was really, I think that captivated a lot of the audience. Mm -hmm. I think that resonated the deliciousness. I was very excited about also their initiative to uh, reduce and mix portion sizes. So he was talking about desserts and you can have lava cake all big chocolate or big caramel and big indulgent foods or a, a, a scoop of sorbet or a bowl of berries. Why not combine these? Why not have a little bit of an indulgence in your dessert with some fruits, which is what consumers may want instead of having to share multiple desserts. And which a culinarian can create for them. And he did the same thing with the protein. So we've been asking yeah. people to eat less meat forever. And so is the choice no meat or meat? 
No, no, no. It's a merger, as mm -hmm. you're just saying. So yeah. have a mushroom blend burger where you reduce some of the beef and you put that in, or have some great um, international fusion cuisine where you've got Asian veggies with strips of beef or strips of chicken. It's not yeah. the main thing. So then that was followed up by Junjo Lee, who comes from a very consumer-driven perspective. She's an anthropologist who does ethnographic work. So she goes in and sits in people's homes for days and days at a time and asks them why they're making all the decisions they are, and she watches them do things. So one of, one of the favorite comments I heard her say was that she found some people who seemed to be health nuts, but they weren't the ones eating the healthiest. They actually had healthy bars and healthy junk foods stuck here and there, where she found some other people who live to eat. They just love food. And when she went there, it wasn't packaged processed food. It was, they'd just gone shopping that day. It was lots of veggies. They were cooking and they live to eat, which somehow brings that back to that deliciousness that Greg mm -hmm. Drescher was talking about. Yep. So I feel like we ended this session thinking, yeah, we really have a lot of evidence about what a healthy diet is, but we're making very limited impact on global or national behavior change. And maybe this idea of leading with taste and deliciousness, having the evidence in the background, but, but understanding that all these different real life human beings, consumers, shoppers, diners, they're approaching food mm -hmm. with all kinds of complex issues. And maybe if we bring some of these other partners into our research, we would be able to connect better and see more of a change and make the needle move more.